already been given the victory. Um, hold your place, look over in Romans 5, and you could see in Romans 5, once you've already believed the gospel, that you've already been given the victory. In Romans 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have already been declared just. And God has already declared us just by faith. We already have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by His blood. We have already been justified by His blood. Verse 11, not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. So if God has already justified you by His blood and He has already given you the atonement, there is nothing you can do to be unjustified or unatoned. God has already declared you just. He has already, the Lord Jesus Christ's blood has already atoned for your sins. You already have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you already have the victory. So going back to 1 Corinthians 15, that's why he says in verse 57, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say he will give us the victory. It says he's already given it. He giveth us in the, in the present tense. He's already given us the victory over death. We already have that. And notice what verse 58 says, Therefore, based on the fact that you already have eternal life, therefore, my beloved brethren, we are loved in Christ. We are brethren with, with Paul and with all those who have been saved. Therefore, because that has already taken place, be ye steadfast, unmovable. So stand, be established in the doctrine, in the gospel. Do not allow Satan to toss you to and fro with every wind of doctrine and with cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's Ephesians 4. Don't allow that to happen. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And, and so if you keep in mind the gospel by which you have received eternal life, then you will be saved from Satan's attacks. You will be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And the result then is that your labor will not be in vain. Your labor will be proclaiming a clear gospel to others, proclaiming sound doctrine to others, so that they may be recovered from the snare of the devil with false doctrine, or that they uh, may be saved if they haven't already been saved. Then your labor is not in vain. Go back to verse 2 in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. You notice what he said, again, this conditional thing we mentioned, by which, in other words, by the gospel, also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So in other words, you believe, you're justified by faith, you have peace with God, you're justified by His blood, you have the atonement, all of that right now, the moment you believe. But then the issue is sanctification. What happens after that? If I choose not to keep in mind that salvation was a gift of God, that eternal life comes through the blood of Christ and His resurrection, and, it, and that I cannot in my flesh serve God. If I refuse to keep that in mind, then I am not saved from the attacks of Satan, and then I have believed in vain. Not that I lose my salvation, but my belief is produces no fruit. And so he mentions that being in vain, you notice... Um, and so then the contrast then is if they, the end of the chapter there, if they understand the victory that they have through our Lord Jesus Christ, keep that gospel in mind, then when the attacks of Satan come to get them away from that, then they are going to be, as verse 58 says, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and then their labor is not in vain. So the gospel is gives you eternal life if you trust in it. And that's a done deal. God cannot unatone you. He cannot unjustify you. You have the gift of eternal... Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. If I have to work to maintain my salvation, 
then it is no longer a gift. It is a gift given to me. And where the work part comes in in relation to the gospel is as we saw in 1 Corinthians 15 too, is that I need to keep in mind that I did not earn my salvation, that I did not do anything, and I cannot do anything to improve myself, to serve the Lord. I just need to keep in mind Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, what He did for me. And then I allow Him to work through me. And when I do that, then I'm steadfast, unmovable in that I'm established in my gospel. As Paul says, establish you according to my gospel. I'm established in that. And then I allow the preaching of the revelation of the mystery, which is the rest of the sound doctrine found in Paul's epistles, to sanctify me. And then Christ lives through me as the Holy Spirit teaches me the things of God as I read them in Paul's epistles. And so then, when Satan's attack comes then I am steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And then my labor is not in vain. The labor results in fruit. People being saved, people being coming into the knowledge of the truth. Not because of anything I do, but it's Christ living through me as I believe the doctrine found in Paul's epistles. And so that's where the issue comes. Like I said, the word gospel is mentioned 98 times in the New Testament. Most of them relate to the gift of eternal life because that's primary. That's what you have to be established in first. But then there are also some references that relate to the sanctification part. And that's not where you, you can't lose your salvation. It's just keeping in mind the gospel so that you're not trying to add the works of man to it. There are other examples we could go through, but I think that's enough to you know see what the Word of God is doing. So we mentioned that Satan attacks and tries to keep people from believing a clear gospel message. And he uses, it. so in 2 Corinthians 11, we saw in, in verse 15 that these false apostles and deceitful workers are called Satan's ministers. And they are transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Because a clear gospel is not taught in even fundamental mainstream Christianity, you've got, number one, the first problem is you've got a lot of people who may not even be saved who are graduating from seminaries or who go to churches. Because if they just talk about, we got to get the gospel to the unreached nations, we got to proclaim the gospel to people, there's a lost and dying world out there and they need to know the gospel. But we don't define what the gospel is then I've never heard the good news, so I've never had the opportunity to even believe it. And even if I did hear the good news, we know that Satan is blinding, trying to blind the world from hearing that, lest they be saved. And so chances are, even though you've got in fundamental Christianity, churches who use the Bible and talk about the gospel because they never clearly define it, and because Satan is working against the people, even if they do hear a clear gospel, uh, the chances are that most people that attend even fundamental Bible-believing churches never hear and never believe the gospel. So if they never do that, then they can't understand Scripture because the things are spiritually discerned. They can never be sanctified. So then they go on to seminary. The professors that teach at the seminaries or teach at these church institutes to get you prepared for being a pastor, they don't believe the gospel. They don't believe the Bible is true because they've never heard a clear gospel or they never believed it. So that's where you get all these false teachings that I mentioned before, the Isaiah, the Deuteronomy, and all those things out there, Daniel, etc. And so then you, what you've got is man's teachers in the seminary. They're not teaching the truth. They become, they are... Satan's ministers, as 2 Corinthians 11.15 says, but they're transformed to appear as ministers of righteousness because they use scripture, but then they use man's philosophy to change it or to move it around to fit their doctrine, not sound doctrine of God's word. So then the people who go to the seminaries don't hear the truth. They're not edified. They don't become sanctified because they're not keeping in mind the gospel because they were never established in the gospel. And so then, they become pastors of churches, graduating from the seminary, and then they're Satan's ministers, because they're never saved anyway, and even if they are saved, they didn't hear the truth, 
because they went to seminaries that didn't teach the truth. And, and so what the result is in modern Christianity is that the gospel, the clear gospel message is not heard. And even if it is, uh, very few people actually believe it because of Satan's work on that end. And all that's taught is man's philosophies and lies, and it appears to be righteousness and God's word. And so you might ask, well, why? What are they doing then? What when they talk about gospel? Why do they mention that? Well, they mention they mention it because if you use key terms from Scripture, then you appear to be representing God. You know, if you, for example, the uh, the Mormons, they use the term. They say they are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and they will make the argument with you that they are Christians. And the reason they are Christians is because they they say. They represent Jesus Christ. In other words, if I put my if I put Jesus Christ's name in the name of my church, then I automatically am representing Christ. I am automatically a minister of God. That's their argument. That's what they'll tell you um, if you try to tell them that well, you're not teaching what Scripture says. Well, yeah, we are. We're 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 Christians just like you because we've got that term in there. And so churches, fundamental Christianities, will use. Their name badge. Remember? Their name badge. What? They they say they believe in God because Jesus' name is on their name badge, which I told the one person, the one Mormon, I could take that name badge off of you and put it on an atheist and walk up and have them walk up and down the street. Doesn't make them a Christian or mm -hmm. believe in Jesus. Yeah. So they they just put the name Jesus on their name badge and they think. They represent Christ. Anything they say then must be what Christ says because I've got Christ's name on my badge. Um, and that's just simply not the case. And, and the same thing, and the sad thing is it's the same thing of fundamental Christianity. They use that term gospel. And I'll tell you what has happened in America, and this is based on what I've read about American history, and it's based on my observations is that uh, this is what's happened in, in Christianity here, is that when you look back at the founding of this country, by the way, I'm recording this on the 4th of July, uh, 2016, so 240 years ago there was a Declaration of Independence. And the reason there was a Declaration of Independence is you had these people who believed what you know whatever they believed about Christianity. Uh, a lot of them had some real good sound doctrine that they believed, but there were variances in what they believed. And they were being persecuted in England because England had an established religion. If a Catholic ruler was in there, well, then they start killing the Protestants. If it's a Protestant ruler, then they're against the Catholics. And then you've got the Bible believers who don't really fall into either one of those categories. And they're persecuted because they don't go either with the Protestants or the Catholics. And so the result was, is here's this land... Um, I don't know what it was called back then. Was it just called America? I know it wasn't the United States of America. But anyway, the land that we now call the United States of America. And there were people, there were some colonization efforts going on with the English and other groups. And so there were groups that were suffering for what they believed. And so then they came over to the new land, uh, which is known as USA today, to get away from the religious tyranny that they experienced in England or France or whatever country they were in. And so then you had these different groups set on. For example, William Penn was uh, with the Quakers, and that's where the name Pennsylvania comes from. Mary Land uh, is going back to the Catholics, uh, Mary's Land, uh, Catholics settling there, um, and different other groups. So you've got all these Christian groups which you could call denominations, that are getting away from England, they come over here and they settle in America where they have the freedom of religion, where they could believe whatever they want. And all of them are Christian denominations, but they all believe a little differently. But now they're all in one group and they have this freedom. And so in order to keep the peace, because the, you know, the people in Maryland are going to do Catholic stuff, and the people in Pennsylvania are going to believe Quaker stuff, and the, the two are opposed. And so there comes a point in time in America's history, uh, quite a ways after the Declaration of Independence, and more Christians had settled here, and 
uh, more people are here. Uh, I believe it's uh, maybe at least a hundred, maybe uh, longer, a hundred years later after uh, that happened, that there's this idea, well, let's just bring it all together, get some common ground that we can agree upon so that we can all live together, and that way we don't kill each other in this new country, and then we're just creating something that we already had in England. The result of that was that they they focused on two things. The first thing was they all agreed that we should obey the Ten Commandments. And the second thing is that we should follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's why in the late 1800s uh, they began to make anything Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they established red letters. And so if you look at fundamental Christianity today, um, or if you ask people, you know, are you going to have eternal life? Usually the first thing they say, if they're an unbeliever, is they'll say, yes, I'll have eternal life because I'm a good person. I obey the Ten Commandments, you know, better than others. So they go back to the Ten Commandments because that was our heritage. And then when you look among Christianity, they'll say, yes, I'll have eternal life because I believe what Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the red letters. And so... Fundamental Christianity says that they read Scripture, they read their Bible, but for the most part, they only read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what they've done then is the term gospel or good news has then been taken away from the my gospel. Paul says if you preach any other gospel than my gospel, which we've seen as Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins, if you believe any other thing than that, he says, let him be accursed who does that. That's somebody, if they don't believe Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for their sins, they do not have eternal life. That's what it's defined as, my gospel. And so what they'll do then, because that's a minority view, because the flesh says, I won't work. And so we've seen Satan and what he does. Satan tries to keep you from learning that gospel. And if you do learn the gospel, he tries to keep you from teaching it to others and he tries to pervert it and so if all these Christian denominations in America want to get along they're not going to take that minority view of say no to the flesh and just believe the gospel and no works involved they're going to introduce works so they introduce works with the Ten Commandments we'll all agree we need to obey the Ten Commandments but the Bible says under Paul it says that uh, that he took those Ten Commandments and he nailed that law to the cross, uh, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2, 14 and 15. But yet Christianity allows the perversion of Satan to come in and says, we follow the Ten Commandments. And then they've done the same thing with the term gospel, because if I use the word gospel, just like if I say I'm a minister of Jesus Christ, then you're going to say that I'm a minister of righteousness when I'm not. And so they've taken the term gospel and they've applied it to anything that Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've seen the gospel today is not that. We've seen it's trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. But what fundamental Christianity does is they preach Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the gospel. Now, and so if you look at, they'll say, you know, divide your Bible up into different sections. They'll say, you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy is the Pentateuch or the law. Then uh, uh, Joshua through wherever they place the Second Chronicles probably. Um, that would be Old Testament history. Uh, they probably go through Nehemiah. Probably Joshua through Nehemiah, Old Testament history. Then Esther through Ecclesiastes is going to be your wisdom, poetry type books. And then they get to Isaiah through Malachi is your prophets. And then every single Christian, you know, when they do this division that I've ever heard, they always say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. That's the good news. Now that term Gospel is only applied to those books one time, it's in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Go over there and look at Mark 1.1. 1, 1. And so what they've done is they've taken this verse here and they've said that then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all Gospels. And only one of them is called that. At Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it says the beginning of the Gospel 
of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so they take that term that's right there, and what they've done is they've added, you notice your headline of that book, probably, um, it says, The Gospel According to St. Mark. It's probably what the headline of your Bible says there. Um, and if you look in, well, okay, while we're here, look at this. So Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it doesn't say, Mark 1.1 1, 1 does not say the Gospel of St. Mark. It says the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And what it's saying, what it means is, gospel means good news. And the fact that Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life, died for the sins of people, and came and preached to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that's good news. I mean, we hadn't had that good news yet. That's why you see the term gospel not being used until you get to the book of Matthew. But we've seen Paul say, that's not the good news for today. The good news by which you are saved, by which you have eternal life, is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. But remember what Satan tries to do, and they're trying to get all these Christian denominations to get together. And so, and it's very deceitful. What, remember what we read over in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, what Paul says that he did not do. He said, not handling. Let me get there. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. He says, they have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Look also in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. So you have, if you're using slight of men, cunning craftiness, and you're deceiving people by having a false gospel preached so that no one can be saved, then what you're going to do is you're going to use the where you see the word gospel here in Mark 1.1 1, 1, and pervert it and make people think that the gospel that is for today, and Paul says if you preach another gospel other than my gospel, which is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins, then you are to be accursed. Let him be accursed. And so... The gospel of Jesus Christ certainly is good news. Without Him coming and without Him living and dying on a cross, there is no eternal life for anybody who has ever lived. But what they do, but, that, but the gospel that we preach, by which you are saved, by which you receive eternal life, isn't every word that Jesus said in red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the gospel that Paul preached, which is trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. It's not following the Sermon on the Mount. And so what churches have done is they know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they know the Ten Commandments, but they don't know much of anything else. They don't know what Paul teaches, or if they do, they don't know where it's located in his epistles, even though that's what's written for us today. They don't know their Old Testament. They know this common ground that was established, which is the red letters of Jesus. And they establish it with this. So in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so now, in order to have uniformity of teaching and everybody getting along in America, then what they've done in Christianity is they've said all the teachings of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are are the gospel. And so then they, they have these headlines up here, and these, these headings are actually came before, um, before America, but you can see it says, the gospel according to St. Mark. And then if you look in the beginning of Matthew, and probably, I'm, you know, this is man's heading there before you get to the actual chapter verse, so your Bible may differ. I'm just telling you what my Bible says and what most Bibles will say. Uh, the heading for Matthew. It says, The Gospel According to St. Matthew. Um, the saint there, that, that shows you right there it's a Catholic invention because they're the ones who declare people saints when really all saved people are saints. 
in Luke. It says the gospel according to St. Luke. And then the book of John, the gospel according to St. John. Those are not titles that God puts in there. Those are titles that man added and Catholics added. You want to see another uh, really bad title, look at the book of Revelation. And you'll see what the Catholics did on that one. The title in the book of Revelation, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. So now we've deified St. John. We've made him divine. God doesn't say that. God's, God's no respecter of persons. God says, you know, he's a man. He's a saved man. He has eternal life. <coughs> but he wasn't some divinity that came on earth. He was a man. But the Catholic Church says St. John the Divine. So the point is, the reason that fundamental Christianity uses the term gospel and never defines it is because in their view... The gospel is all of the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And their view is if you follow all the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, except the ones that they don't like, which you'll find out as you get into it, but they'll tell you if you believe and follow the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the gospel, and that's how you are saved. So that's why they never give a clear definition. We can give a clear definition and say the gospel is trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. That's what 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says. But if you believe the gospel isn't just that simple statement, and you believe it's everything that Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can't very succinctly mention in a sermon the gospel is this, because the gospel is everything that Jesus said. And so now you've got to read all this stuff and follow all this stuff in order to have eternal life. That's why a clear gospel message is not preached in churches. It's all about this unity into one Christian religion in the United States so that there's not wars here going on. And what it's done is it's taken the clear gospel message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and it's completely destroyed it. And the only way you're going to get that clear gospel message is by reading your Bible and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach it to you or by someone who actually teaches it, which is few and far between today. So um, this title of this message, What is the Gospel? And we've learned it. And now we hopefully see why uh, fundamental Christianity doesn't teach it and they teach something different. And that should be a danger to us to not trust what they say but to rely upon God and His Word. And once we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach us the things of God, and we can learn those things. And in closing, look over in 2 Timothy 2. <coughs> Another um, one about the Gospel. I told you that Paul says the term my Gospel is given four times in his epistles.